American University in Bulgaria. Well, hello everybody. Um, my name's Ken Heather and uh, I teach economics uh, at the University of Portsmouth in uh, southern England. But I have a contact with uh, a university in Sofia, and so I'm over in Bulgaria uh, two or three times a year. And I always love coming to the place. And Georgi kindly invited me to come down and uh, um, meet some people in Blagojevgrad. I've not been in this particular town before, and um, uh, give a lecture. And um, I thought, what is it that might appeal to your interests? And something that economists often talk about, which tends to be interesting to pretty much everybody, is the distribution of income. What is fair? Um, Naomi Campbell and people like her, they walk up and down a catwalk for a few hours a week and get paid $50,000 an hour. And she's not even pretty. And at the same time, you've got lots of people who are struggling on pensions to survive. You've got people working for a minimum wage. And almost everybody you meet, it, they, 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 it screams out to them, this is unfair, this isn't right. And, and then they start thinking, well, what, what, what have economists got to say about the way income is distributed in society? Uh, what do economists think is fair and just? Uh, so that's the topic I want to talk to you about. And the way I want to do it is this. I first of all want to think not about what's fair and just, but about um, the way in which income is actually distributed. Just how uneven is it? Um, then when we've done that, we'll think about some reasons why income is so unevenly distributed. What is it that enables Naomi Campbell to get these absurd sums of money? Then I'll think a bit about what governments do to change the distribution of income. And then finally, we'll get round to saying, what do economists think is right? When you ask an economist for what's a fair distribution of income, what does he say? So we'll take a while getting there, but if we look at these other things first of all, when we get there, I think we'll have something more powerful to say. So the first thing I want to do is to focus on how income is distributed typically in a market kind of society. And there's an informal way of doing it, and then a more formal way. Uh, the informal way that gives you a good sense of, 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 of how uneven the distribution actually is, is to have a little parade. And so we take a, a typical society like the UK, where I come from, and we're gonna give everybody in the UK a height which reflects their income. So if they are averagely well off, they're going to be averagely tall, but the poor people will shrink proportionately. And then the rich people will give them a, a, a very tall um, a height which reflects how well off they are. So everybody in the UK now has a height which reflects their income. And uh, we're gonna line them all up outside of the door and uh, with the shortest at the front and the tallest at the back, um, we're going to have a parade and they're going to come through the door and out of the window in the space of one hour. And we're going to watch the parade. And what is fairly typical for the UK is going to be reasonably typical for many market kinds of societies. Remember the short people are at the front. So what happened... Oh, you're not that short, is he? Um, um, so what happens when the parade begins? Um, for the first few minutes, you don't need to open the door. They'll crawl under the crack at the bottom. But as the parade goes on, and these people are getting taller and taller, how long before the average height person appears? In the UK, it's 49 minutes. And you think, how could, how could it take so long when you've only got an hour? 
uh, because there's a relatively small number of people at the back of the parade who are 200, 500, 1,000 kilometers high who can't even get their heel through the door. So, a little bit of elementary statistics, what that means is that if you come to the UK and earn a mean average salary, you're going to be better off than over three quarters of the population because the distribution of income is so skewed. Now, that's a very informal way. There's a, there's a, a much more formal way of looking at the distribution of income, which is quite helpful uh, when you want to make comparisons between societies. Uh, and it's called the Gini coefficient. And I'll just show you quickly how the Gini coefficient is measured um, because it's quite useful. And it's very simple. What you do is you, you draw a square box. And uh, along here, you plot the percentage of the population from zero to 100%. But it's cumulative. So it's from the poorest to the richest. So this 10% spot means the poorest 10%. And this spot here means the poorest 50%. So it's them plus the next lot. And this lot here, the poorest 90%, is everybody except the richest 10%. And then up here, you plot the percentage of the income from zero to 100%. So if you had a society where the distribution of income was perfectly even, everybody's got the same, then 10% of the population would have 10% of the income, and 50% of the population would have 50% of the income, 90%, 90% of the income, and so on. And you could draw a line from one quarter to the other, and the distribution would be measured by that straight line, that line of equality. When you actually measure a typical society, what you get is that the poorest 10% have only got, say, 1% of the income, and the poorest 50% have only got 15% of the income, and the poorest 90 have only got 65% of the income. And so the line that you actually get looks something like that, which is called a Lorentz curve, uh, after a guy called Lorentz who thought of it, uh, which measures the actual distribution. And you can see that the more uneven the distribution, the further away from this line of equality the Lorentz curve is going to go. And so if you measure that area for a society as a proportion of this triangle, you've got a measure of income distribution. Where if you had a society where everybody had exactly the same, this area would be zero. It would follow the line of equality. So perfect equality gets you a number of zero. Now imagine a society where one person's got everything and no one else has got anything. The Lorentz curve goes along like this because 99.999% of the population got nothing. And so now, this area, as a proportion of the triangle, is one. So perfect inequality gives you a number of one. And so a measure between zero and one tells you how even or uneven the distribution of income is. Now, that's a useful one because we, we've got measures of how income is distributed. And so, to give you the sorts of numbers, these numbers change slightly over time, but to give you a sort of idea of the sorts of numbers we're talking about, a typical European society, EU, would have a number around about 0.32, something like that. Uh, the most even in Europe would tend to be the Scandinavian countries. Um, so Finland is somewhere around about 0.22-ish. Um, the UK, relatively uneven for Europe, around about 0.3839, something like that. America, somewhere around about 0.45-ish, something like that. So that gives you a sense of the way in which income distribution varies between countries, with the Finns somewhere near the top. Um, the Finns tend to have a high view of, of equality, uh, and it's reflected in their society in all kinds of ways, uh, even fines for breaking the law. Fines in the UK 
if you, if you break the speeding limit and you get caught, uh, they charge you 60 pounds or 100 pounds. In Finland, they charge you a proportion of your income. A few years ago, there was a guy uh, who was going through Helsinki and uh, on his motorbike uh, in a 40 kilometer area, and uh, he was doing something like 46 kilometers. And he got caught, and um, he happened to be one of the directors of Nokia when Nokia was at the very height of its uh, success. And he had this enormous income from shares. And he got a fine of something, as I remember it, something like 275,000 euros. Now, that's, that's quite a large fine. But see, if you have a society which believes in equality, that's the kind of thing that you get. Uh, these numbers change over time. One of the biggest changes which has taken place in the last uh, 30 years or so has been in former communist societies in Eastern Europe where before the fall of communism in uh, around about the 90s, the sorts of numbers that you were talking about was something like the Finns, around about 0.22-ish. Now, in many societies in Eastern Europe, it's somewhere around about 0.4-ish. So these numbers change over time, but it, it enables you to make comparisons and say how even or uneven uh, is the distribution of income. So that just gives you a general sense of the situation as it is. Uh, next thing I want to think about for a while is to ask uh, why, why is it like that? We're still not thinking about what's right and fair. We're just thinking about uh, what's the explanation for these distributions? What makes the distribution of income uneven? Uh, there's a number of things which are key to understanding this. And the first one is, it's like it because of the distribution of wealth. Now, wealth and income are not the same thing. Are we all clear about what the distinction is? Income is a flow. It's so much per period of time. Wealth is a stock. It's an amount. It's your assets. I work for the University of Portsmouth, and um, they pay me a salary of um, about a million pounds a year, and that is my income. It's so much per period of time. They pay me so much, I don't know what to do with it all. So I put lots of it in the bank, and I've got about 12 million pounds sitting in the bank. That's not my income, that's my wealth. It's a stock, it's an amount independent of the question of time. And when you look at the distribution of wealth in society, it's much more uneven than the distribution of income. Uh, sorry if I use the UK as, as an example, but I know more about the UK. Um, when you think about the distribution of wealth in the UK, what things constitute wealth for most people? Uh, the obvious things are a house, you own a house that you live in, uh, and the other is um, shares in companies, stocks and shares and so on. Over half the people in the UK don't own any stocks and shares, don't own their own house. They have zero wealth. So wealth is very concentrated in the hands of a relatively small number of people. And those people at the back of the parade who were a thousand kilometers high are not there because they get paid lots of money by working. They get huge incomes from their ownership of wealth, land and, and uh, shares and so on. So the uneven wealth distribution tends to lead to an uneven income distribution. But of all the income that people get, something of the order of 70% of it comes from labor, wages and salaries, people working for it. So we have to think about 
why some kinds of labour get paid much more than others. It's the differences in wage rates which are an important part of explaining the uneven distribution of income. So we could ask the question, why does a doctor get paid so much more than a gardener? And if you ask non-economists for the answer to that question, you always get the same answer. It always goes something like this. Um, well, people value a doctor's services. A doctor could save your life. Um, without him, you might die. You're willing to pay a great deal for a doctor. That's why he gets a relatively high income. Um, it's nice having a gardener, save you to trim the bushes and cut the grass, but it's hardly in the same league as saving your life, so people are willing to pay the gardener less, so the gardener gets paid less. Uh, that is almost a universal answer amongst non-economists, and it is wrong. The idea is to see that it's no explanation for the distribution, the uneven distribution of income at all. Why not? Well, imagine for a moment living in a world where it's incredibly easy to move from one kind of job to another. Now, I know the world isn't like that, but just give me for a minute a world where it's really easy. Um, I've been a teacher now for years. I'm bored. I think I'll be a lawyer. Um, I've been a doctor for years. I'm fed up with doing that. I think I'll be a policeman. Just imagine it was very easy to move from one kind of occupation to another. Um, here are these gardeners earning very little and these doctors earning a lot. The gardeners say... I'm fed up with this. I think I'd rather earn more money. I'll go and be a doctor. The supply of gardeners falls and their wage rate begins to rise. The supply of doctors increases. I just like the supply of tomatoes increasing depresses the price of tomatoes. So increasing the supply of doctors depresses the price of doctor services, the wage rate and the wage rates of doctors begin to fall. And the process goes on until everybody is earning pretty much the same wage rate. The fact that people value doctor services more simply means that we have more doctors and fewer gardeners. It doesn't explain differences in the wage rate. So when you ask, why is the wage rate different? The essence is to see it's in the immobility of labour. It's in the things which make it difficult for people to transfer from one kind of occupation to another. Now, some of those immobilities are a result of natural kinds of abilities of people. Um, I have no head for heights. Um, and I look at these guys who are steeplejacks, you know, and, and, and people who wash windows um, 40 or 50 stories high and so on. And I think no amount of income in the world would persuade me to do that because I, 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 I get nervous standing on thick carpet. So the idea of being up there is, is just terrifying. Um, a few years ago, we made a film. I, I spent quite a lot of time making films and uh, for, uh, for economic ideas. And um, we uh, wanted a film in, in, in Poland, and we wanted a film in Krakow and places about the, their pollution problems. And um, I was with a guy, friend William, who makes films, and he, he has no fear of heights at all. And um, we got permission to film in um, an observatory uh, for the university. Uh, so th this is not where the public can go at all. Um, so, and it's 36 stories up. 
And uh, we get to the building and I say to William, yeah, you, 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 you carry on and, and get the pictures over the town. I'll just sit in the car for half an hour. I'll be here when you come back. He said, no, 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 you, you need to come up with me. I said, no, he said, come on, you've got to. So, so we got 36 stories up. And, and, and we go out on the top of the building. And, and, and it, uh, to me, it feels so high that you're amongst the stars. I'm, I'm terrified. And there's a pole as you go out onto the balcony. There, there's a pole, and I'm, I'm wrapping my arms around the pole. And I'm watching William, and because it's not for the public, the, the, the roof rail is, is down here somewhere. And he's running about with his camera within, within half a meter of the edge. And he's, and I'm, I'm absolutely terrified. And uh, he said, I think you should do a piece to camera now, Ken. And I said, yeah, sure. And, uh, carry on. What do you want me to say? He said, no, 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 you've got to come out on the roof. And, and I'm standing on the roof, and I'm, I'm trying to look calm and talk about pollution and externalities. And my knees are shaking. I'm terrified. And, and, and as soon as I've done my bit, I just ran to the pole. And I just wrapped my arms around the pole again. No, no. Those are clear differences in, in abilities which help to explain immobility. But in a market society, a significant part of immobility comes because of the power of people to prevent mobility. Again, I'm, I'm not sure about here, but in the UK, you take the accounting profession and um, the accounting profession has conned the government that um, they're so concerned for high standards that um, you can only be an accountant if you've passed the exams of the professional accounting bodies. And they fail half the people that take the exams. And you ask the accountants why, and they say, got to keep standards up, you know. It's got nothing to do with keeping standards up. It's reducing the supply of labor, because if you reduce the supply of labor, the wage rate is higher. It's a deliberate attempt to create immobility of labor. And that's not just true of accountants, it's true of lawyers as well. These are imperfections in the market system which prevent mobilities and help to maintain these high kinds of numbers of immobility of labour. One other thing about an explanation of why we have these um, sorts of numbers, it's partly to do with the distribution of wealth. It's partly to do with immobility of labour. And it's partly to do with the fact that some people are unemployed. The people at the front of the parade are not there by and large because they earn low incomes. They're there because they don't earn any income at all. They're unemployed. 55% of Spanish people under 25 are unemployed at the moment. And that's a significant effect on the distribution of income. The people at the front of the parade are there because they have no income because they're unemployed. And some of them are there because they're unemployable. In a market society in a pure market society, the income you receive reflects the value of the output that you produce, right? Get a job when you leave here in a couple of years' time, and you get a job on 100,000 levs a year or something. Why are they going to pay you that much? They're only going to pay you that much if you produce that much worth of output for the company. They're going to pay you that for producing 10,000 levs a year. The company would be bankrupt within weeks. You get an income which reflects the value of the output that you produce. Of course you do. It's in a pure market society. 
the guy who was severely disabled is capable of producing nothing. So what income does he get in a market system? Nothing. So the distribution of income is determined by the distribution of wealth. Differences in wage rates largely determined by uh, immobility of labor and by unemployment and the unemployable. All right, that tells you a little bit about why the distribution of income is what it is. Next thing to think about is, what does the government do about all this? Do, do governments undertake policies to try to lessen the differences in people's income? Do they try to change the Gini coefficient in some way? And most governments do. So now let's think for a while about what the main things are that governments do to change the distribution of income. Oh, just before I do that, sorry, I should have said one thing when we looked at labour markets. Sorry, just going to go back to make one point about labour markets. I'm sorry. There's a widespread misunderstanding about economists that we only consider things to do with money. And so when we look at labor markets and we look at wage rates and so on, that we imagine that the only thing that drives people to work is the income they receive. And you may have thought that that was the case in what I said about labor markets. In fact, economists are very well aware that people work not just for the, what are called the pecuniary benefits, the salary you get, but the non-pecuniary benefits as well. You know, in nursing, people work because of a sense of calling, that that's what it's about. And so they're willing to work and they get a, a benefit which isn't reflected in their wages. Uh, if you had a society where we had a perfect distribution of income, I kind of implied that everyone, uh, sorry, a, a perfect mobility of labor, I kind of implied that everyone would have the same, same income, people switching to the occupations where income is higher and so on. Actually, you wouldn't. Everyone would have the same utility, but for some people, they get a substantial part of their utility from these non-pecuniary benefits. And so what you'd have is that people with lousy, filthy, dirty, horrible jobs would actually have an income higher than the average. And the people with the nice, pleasant jobs like mine, teaching, would actually have a lower than average income. And we'd make up the difference in the non-pecuniary benefits. Yeah. Whereas what you actually have in a market society, you tend to find that the people with the horrible, dirty, lousy jobs get less than the average, and the people with the nice jobs like mine get more than the average. These are the non-pecuniary benefits. Um, some years ago, um, there's a, a, a near where I live in Winchester, uh, in the UK, lovely old uh, city, and there's a very expensive girls' school, a private school. My, is it private? The annual fee for going there is about £30,000 a year. Can you imagine? £30,000. Uh, it's got to be fairly well off to send your child there. And they lost their economist. And they, there were these girls coming up to doing their A-levels and, 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 and nobody to teach them. And somebody knew somebody who knew me. And uh, they, they, they said, Ken, would, would, would you come up and teach these girls for a while um, to their A-levels? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very busy in Portsmouth. I really don't have time. And he said, look, we, we, we'll pay you a load of money. And I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I, I really, really am busy. And they said, look, we'll pay you loads and loads of money. So I said, oh, well, all right then. And, um, 
I was teaching in Portsmouth on Friday morning, and then I would go home, have a quick cup of coffee, and go up to St. Swithin's on the Friday afternoon. And um, we had a carpenter working in the house at the time, young guy in his 20s, very good carpenter. And uh, I, I just drinking my coffee and just about to go out of the door. And he said, what are you, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I said, um, oh, I, I, I'm going up to St. Swithin's. And he said, what, what do you do up there? And I said, oh, I, 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 I teach economics to their sixth form. And he said, sixth form? What are they, 17, 18 year old girls? And I said, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, about that. Can I get this right? You're going to spend the afternoon sitting down chatting to a bunch of 18 year old girls. And I said, um, um, uh, yes, yes. He said, are they going to pay you for that? And I said, um, um, uh, uh, yes, they are. I've never forgotten the look on his face. And he said, men would kill for a job like that. That's what I mean by non-pecuniary benefits. Um, aside from those, we'd all finish up with the same wage rate if we had perfect mobility of labor. Okay, so third of our four things to consider now is what do governments actually do to try to redistribute income towards equality. And there's a number of things to think through. Some of them are fairly obvious, some of them are less so. The first thing is the tax system. Most governments have a system of progressive taxes. And a progressive tax means that as your income rises, you pay a higher proportion of it to the government in tax. It doesn't mean as your income rises, you pay more tax. You pay a higher proportion in tax. So if you had a, um, something like this, um, an income of um, 10,000, whatever it is, levs or whatever, and um, the tax was 1,000, you're paying 10% of your income to the government. Now let's suppose somebody else earns 20,000 and they pay 2,000 tax to the government. That is to say they spend, they pay 10% of it. That's not gonna redistribute income. It's just, it's a more, it's, they're paying more tax but it's not a higher proportion. It leaves the distribution of income unchanged. In order to redistribute income towards equality, what you have to do is raise this figure, pay a higher proportion of your income. So a tax of 3,000 now begins to redistribute income towards equality. Do we have a progressive tax system? Well. I'll illustrate something of that, again, with reference to the UK. If you work in the UK, it appears to be quite progressive. Um, you have um, an income of less than about 7,000 a year, and there's no tax to pay at all. If you earn more than that, the marginal tax, the tax you pay on the next bit, uh, becomes 20%. You pay 20% pence in the pound, beyond about 35,000, earn a bit more and you now pay 40% of any additional income in tax. And beyond some number, which is vastly more than anything I'll ever earn, uh, you earn an extra pound, you pay 45%. So there's a rising marginal tax rate, which means that you have a progressive tax system. <laughs> but it's nowhere near as progressive as you might think because that is the direct tax system. When you look at indirect taxes, value-added tax, for example, value-added tax does the opposite. It's a regressive tax. Um, and it may not be obvious why it's regressive, but think about it like this. If you're in the UK and you drive into a petrol station and you fill up your car with petrol, it'll probably cost you about 80 pounds. Petrol's very expensive. 
And of that 80 pounds, something like 50 pounds of it, over 50 pounds, is tax. The enormous proportion of what you pay is your gift to the government in the form of tax. And your instinct is to think, it doesn't matter whether I'm rich or poor, I pay the same tax, I pay 50 pounds. Yes, but the proportion of your income that you pay in tax is much greater if you're poorer than if you're much richer. So the tax is regressive. Now, when you look at the effect of the overall tax system, direct and indirect tax, it's progressive, but very mildly so. It doesn't do a lot to change the distribution of income. So that's the first way in which governments try to redistribute income. They do it through a rising tax rate. Second uh, way in which they do it is benefits. Uh, and uh, in many societies, I guess, like the UK, if you've got children and, uh, and you come from a poor home, the, the kids can have free school meals. Um, if they don't, they don't get the free school meals. So those benefits are an attempt to redistribute income by trying to help lower income groups in, in various ways. The third way in which governments help lower income groups is slightly less obvious, and that is that when they provide benefits at the point of use, it redistributes income towards equality. So in the UK, we have a national health service. And um, if you break your leg, um, you can get it mended and you can pay for it. Our society has to pay for it, but it comes out of general taxation. And so if you have a progressive rate of tax, it's the higher income groups that's paying a bit more, and the lower income groups gain relatively more because they don't pay at the point of use. Education, free school education, you don't pay at the point of use. So you send your ch children to school, that's free. Somebody's got to pay for it paid for by the state, that is to say by general taxation, but if taxation is paid for more by higher income groups, it's a way of redistributing income to lower income groups, okay? I think it does it less than most people realize. Um, I'll give you a few examples to show you why. Uh, take education. In the UK, you could drive up a road and find that there are two houses which are identical in every way, except one's on one side of the road and one's on the other. And the one on this side of the road is 20,000 pounds more than the one on this side of the road. How do you think, what's going on? And it turns out that the one on this side of the road is in a catchment area with a very good school. And the one on this side of the road is in a catchment area with a pretty poor school. So what's happening, the higher income groups are forcing up the prices of houses on this side of the road because they want their kids in the better school. They use their income to get the school that they want. So the best state schools tend to finish up in the hands of the places, tend to finish up in the hands of the people with the higher income. Is that true of uh, medical care? I think it's partly true of medical care as well. People from higher socioeconomic groups know how to use the system and get more than their share of healthcare benefits. A few years ago, a friend of mine was really quite unwell. I went to visit him and he, he was really quite unwell. Lovely guy, Derek. Um, not very bright, went in to see him and uh, he looks in a mess and his nose is streaming and his eyes are red and he looked dreadful. And I said, Derek, why don't you ring up the doctor and get an appointment? We've got a, we've got a national health system. He doesn't have to pay. Why don't you ring up and get an appointment? 
And he said, oh, I tried that. I rang up and, and they said, um, the doctor hasn't got any free appointments until next Tuesday. And I thought, well, by next Tuesday, I'll be better or I'll be dead. What's the point? So he didn't consume any healthcare resources. Now, a few days later, I was feeling dreadful. Maybe I caught it off of him, but my nose is running and my eyes are red and I'm feeling gen generally dreadful. But I come from a higher socioeconomic group than Derek. I know how to use the system. So I rang the doctor and said, I'd like, I'd, I'd like to see the doctor, please. And I got the same kind of answer. And she said, um, the receptionist said, uh, yes, certainly you can see the doctor next Tuesday or whatever. And I said, um, no, 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 I'm not ill next Tuesday. I'm ill now. I'd like to see the doctor now. And she said, well, I'm sorry, but the doctor's um, got a full appointments list. I'm, I'm sorry, there are just no appointments available until next Tuesday. So I said, I'm, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, and I fully understand. And, um, you know, if, 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 you could, if you could live with my death on your conscience, well, then, of course, I fully understand. And she said, um, uh, look, is this very serious? Um, perhaps you better describe the symptoms to me. So I said, um, yes, doctor, um, I've, got, I've got this. I'm sorry, you're, you're not a doctor. C -c Can I just get this right? You have no medical qualifications whatsoever, and you're prepared to make a diagnosis of my medical condition over the phone. Have we, have we got this right? And this conversation went on for five minutes, and at the end of it, she said, look, I think you'd better come and see the doctor this afternoon. If you know how to use the system because you're from a higher socioeconomic group, you consume more healthcare resources than a person from the lower socioeconomic group. So, yes, such a policy does tend to redistribute income towards equality, but not as much as you might imagine. And then the last one, a policy of redistributing income, is a very controversial one. Um, the minimum wage. The government wants to redistribute income and it hasn't got any money to do it. Get the employers to pay. Raise the minimum wage. Make them pay a higher wage rate. That'll help, won't it? Well, some economists have said, actually, it might not. If you raise the minimum wage, employers that would have been willing to pay the lower wage can't afford to pay the higher wage, and this guy becomes unemployed. They sack him. Now what you've done is put this guy at the front of the parade, and you've worsened the distribution of income by creating more unemployment. Uh, the reason why that's controversial is that there have been quite a lo lot of studies in the last year or so suggesting that the effect of raising the minimum wage in the sorts of levels that we're talking about at the moment has had very little effect on unemployment. So it's a controversial issue, but there's no certainty that a minimum wage helps in the distribution of income. Okay, so now having thought through some of those issues, we're ready to say, what do economists really think is the right the fair distribution of income. What ought it to look like? And if you speak to most economists and ask them that, the answer you're likely to get is this. They're likely to say, don't know really, um, your value judgment is as valid as mine. Um, you might think it ought to be more uneven, I less so. What gives me the right to decide? I can't tell you. But what I could do is point out five or six things that you need to think about when you make your own decision about what you think is a fair distribution of income. And the five or six or seven things that you might like to think through go something like this and I'll just run some of them past you now uh, and get you to think some of these through. First one, you have to be very clear in your mind 
as to what you mean when you talk about fairness and justice. What you can find is that two people will disagree about what is the fair and just distribution of income because they have a different view of justice. Let me illustrate that. Here's one person's view of justice. Uh, I look at this guy and he's single. He's only got himself to look at after. And this guy, he's got a wife and he's got six children to support. This guy's needs are much greater than this guy. It's only just that he has a higher income that reflects his greater needs. That's a view of justice. Here's somebody else, and he is also keen to have a just system. And he has a view of justice, but his justice, his view of justice is rather different. And it goes like this. We each earn an income which reflects the value of the output we produce. As we said earlier on, your income reflects what you produce for society. So if I earn that money, I earned it in producing that much output for society. It is only just that I receive an income which reflects the value of the output that I produce. What right has some government got to take lumps of it away from me? Think about it like this. I'm walking down the street one night and somebody hits me over the head, takes 40% of my money out of my wallet and runs off. And the police catch him and they throw him in jail and they say, that's robbery. He's in jail now. The government takes 40% of my income away in tax. And they don't call it robbery, they call it social justice. That's not social justice, it's legalised robbery. I earn that money, I'm entitled to it. <coughs> justice says I should have an income which reflects the value of the output I produce. Let me warn you, there's, if it hadn't happened to you already, there's going to come a day when you're going to go and work for a firm and at the end of the first month, they're going to give you a piece of paper. And in the top left-hand corner, it's going to tell you what you would have got if it hadn't been for the government's tax policy. And in the bottom right-hand corner, they'll tell you what you've got left as a result of the government's tax policy. If this hasn't happened to you yet, you have to set aside half an hour. One minute to observe the difference in the two numbers and 29 minutes to weep uncontrollably at the difference between the two numbers. Justice, to some people, means I receive an income which reflects the value of the output that I produce. Now, if you've got these two different people with different views of justice, they both want a just distribution of income. They both want justice. But they're never going to agree because they haven't agreed as to what constitutes justice. So we have to decide, you have to decide for yourself what you mean by a just distribution of income, okay? Second thing to try to think about is, are we a society or are we a group of individuals? Um, Margaret Thatcher, uh, lady prime minister from not very long ago famously said there's no such thing as society uh, think about do you think we're a society or a group of individuals let me explain why that's important for you to think through um, does your income your welfare your sense of well-being does it depend upon what you get regardless of what anybody else gets or does it depend upon what you get relative to what all the people around you get? 
Think about it like this. Um, you're all struggling here to get through your degree. There's fees to pay and accommodation and food to eat and so on. I'm here to help. And I'm going to make you two choices to help you. Choice one, you can all have an extra 10% on your income. Here's my alternative offer. You can have 15% more. But if you go for that one, it's only for you, and everybody else on your course is going to have an extra 100%. Uh, which would you prefer? 10% for everybody, 15% for you, and 100% for everybody else? Hmm? What everybody All your friends, everybody around you. All my friends. Well, everybody else, including your friends. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I really meant just the sort of, you know, the people on the campus. You see, if you ask most economists, they will assume that you will say 15%. I want as much income as I can get. What other people are getting is of no concern to me. My well-being depends upon how much income I receive. But some economists think that people's sense of well-being depends not only upon the income they get, but upon how their income compares with other people's. Now, just to tell you, I've asked that question to hundreds of students. I don't know whether this will come as a surprise to you, but something of the order of 85% of them say, I think I'd rather just have 10%. In which case, most of us think that our well-being depends not only upon our income, but our income relative to other people. Maybe the people at the front of the parade would feel better off if we took a hundred kilometers off the people at the back of the parade, even if they weren't any taller, they'd feel taller because the people at the back of the parade weren't so tall. That's the issue you have to think about, yeah? Third thing to think about is, do you believe in the concept of a diminishing marginal utility of income? We think that for most goods, the more of the good you have, the happier you are. But the amount that you get from an extra bit, the amount of extra happiness you get, gets less and less. You eat one or two beef burgers and enjoy them, you get one more, and the extra utility you get is getting smaller now because you're fairly full up with the things. And, and economists think that this principle of a diminishing marginal utility has no known exceptions except women buying shoes. <laughs> now, some economists will say that whilst it's true of individual goods, it's not true of income. Uh, people always want more income, and there isn't a declining marginal utility of income. If there is, then there's a case for saying we should redistribute income towards equality. Take a pound away from a rich man, uh, it doesn't mean very much to him. Give it to a poor person, it means a great deal to him. If you've got a diminishing marginal utility of income, there is an argument, it may not be an overpowering argument, but it's certainly an argument for redistributing income towards equality, diminishing marginal utility of income, okay? The reason why not all economists will accept that is that other economists will point out that um, Different people have a different capacity to enjoy income. Are you going to stop people from working harder and earning more income because they happen to enjoy income and other people would prefer to be lazy and uh, uh, have a lower income? Uh, some people are incredibly um, 
caught up with more possessions and it gives them great utility to get more and more things. Um, at the extreme, there's a story told of um, this guy and um, he's just bought himself a brand new Ferrari and uh, he drives it 50 yards down the road and stops the brand new car to buy himself a newspaper and he opens the door and as he opens the door a lorry comes by and takes off the door of his new Ferrari. He is beside himself with anger and he calls the policeman over and he says, I want that guy found, I want him hung up, I want him shot, I want him ruined, I want him destroyed in pieces. And the policeman says, I'm sir, this is obviously an English story because the policeman calls him sir. But um, he says, sir, um, you, you do seem to be caught up with material possessions. And the guy says, why, why, why do you say that? And the policeman said, well, I noticed that when the lorry took the door of the Ferrari off, um, it also took your arm off. And, and you haven't even mentioned that. And, and, and the guy looks down and goes, ah, my Rolex. Um, now, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're not all at that point. You know, different people have a different capacity to enjoy income. Um, so the, the diminishing marginal utility of income thing um, has to be thought through in, in, in that uh, relationship. Um, uh, um, um, oh, gee, I, I, I stick with it for ten, ten more minutes. Um, next thing to think about is the problem of incentives. Most of us respond powerfully to incentives. We do things because we've got an incentive to do it. To what extent do you, by raising taxes, destroy people's incentive to work? If you tax people too heavily, to what extent do they say, well, why should I be bothered then? I might as well take leisure. They can't tax my sitting beside the swimming pool doing nothing. And then the most productive members of society produce less output. Less output means we're less off less well off and we're all poor. A generation ago in the UK, the top rate of tax, you had to be rich for this to be true, but the top rate of tax was 83%, 83 pence in the pound. Unless you earned a bit extra, not by working for it, but in what they called unearned income. Uh, dividends on shares and so on. Then there was a little extra tax of another 15 pence in the pound. So you're very well off and the uh, company you've got shares in sends you another pound and the government says that that's 98 pence for us but you can keep the other 2p all for yourself. And an incoming government said this is madness. Who's going to put themselves out for that kind of amount? And in one budget, they wiped all the top rates of tax out. And the top rate of tax, even on a billionaire earning an extra pound, became only 40%. And those that believe in an even distribution of income are, in, are appalled, of course, that the rich are now getting richer. But the counter argument was, if we don't do that, we're all poorer because we've taken away people's incentives to produce goods and services. So the next thing to think through is the effect of incentives. Um, just very quickly, there's a guy who's fam famous in the economic literature called Art Laffer. And um, Art used to be an advisor to the president uh, in the States, and he was asked once, would it be a good idea to raise taxes to increase government revenue? And the story goes that Art was in a um, cocktail bar at the time talking to him, and he took this uh, paper napkin and drew a diagram uh, which has become the stuff of legend in economics textbooks. And... Um, what he drew was along here, you put the tax rate from zero to 
And up here, you put the tax take, how much the government receives from it. And he said, if you have a zero tax rate, the government clearly gets nothing. If you increase the tax rate, the government gets some revenue. But the disincentive effects are such that people work harder and produce less, and so the government gets less. And there comes a point where increasing the tax rate doesn't, include, doesn't increase government income. And in fact, after a while, it decreases it. And of course, if you have 100% tax, nobody's got any incentive to do anything. And so the tax take falls to zero. Now, I don't think you can argue with that. There's nothing to argue about. It's got to be true. The thing you can argue about is, what's that point? Are we here? So if we increase the tax rate, we make the distribution of income more even, and the government gets some more revenue. Or are we here somewhere where we could actually get more government revenue, more output, by cutting the tax rate. So there's been a lot of discussion in the literature as to where we are on what's become known as the Laffer curve. Um, um, one more, th three more things and then I'll kind of stop. One very interesting idea to think through is we should think not just about the way in which income is distributed, but about how easy it is for people to get out of poverty once they're stuck in it. Think about it like this. You look at one moment in time at some society and you look at the poorest 5% and you say, who are these people? What are the names of these people who are really poor? Now let's look five years on at the poorest 5%. Who are the people? Are they the same ones? Is it the case that once you're stuck in poverty, you're there forever? Or have most of those people got out of poverty and uh, it's somebody different there now? Because there's a strong case for saying, if it's different people, you're less worried than if it's the same people. That once you're stuck in it, you've got no chance of getting out of it. And there was a study done a few years ago which found that it was the American society, the ones with a relatively uneven distribution of income, where there were fewer people who were the same as in European society. Maybe what we should be thinking about is not just the distribution of income, but about what system best enables people who are stuck in poverty to get out of it. So we're not just interested in the distribution of income, but the ease with which people can move from relative poverty to relatively well off. Um, there are two more things, uh, and one of them, I can't read my writing. So just one more and I'll stop. The last thing I want you to think about is whether you think we should focus on the distribution of income or whether we should focus on poverty. And I'll show you in a second that they're not the same thing. You could say, my concern is for the very poor, and I think we need policies that enable us to look after those who are very badly off. Or you could say, I think we should be concerned about the whole distribution of income and how uneven it is. And at first, you might think they're the same question. Now, they're clearly linked. But let me show you that they're not actually quite the same thing. Here are two societies, uh, two societies with, and with magnificent imagination, I'll call them Society A and Society B. And uh, each of these societies has three people in it, Miro, Milena, and Mariella. 
And in society A, there's a hundred pounds, lebs, euros, whatever it is, a hundred euros of income every week. And it's distributed so that Miro gets 60 of it, Milena gets 20, and Mariella gets 20. Uh, society B also has 100 euros between them, but it's distributed differently between them. So that Miro gets 42, Milena gets 42, and Mariella gets 16. If you ask people, uh, what's the fairer society? Nearly everybody says um, B, and you ask them why, and if they don't know any economics, they say, oh, well, in society B, Miro gets two and a half times as much as Mariella, uh, and that's a big difference, but perhaps in society A, he gets three times as much. The, the extremes are not so great in B. Um, if you ask people who um, know a bit more economics, they'll say, uh, hold on while I calculate the Gini coefficient, and then I'll tell you. And it turns out that if you calculate the Gini coefficients, society B has a more even distribution of income. So people are inclined to like B. If you were Mariella and you chose to live in society B, you'd be 25% worse off than if you lived in A. If you were Mariella, wouldn't you rather live in society A? But it's the one with a Gini coefficient that reflects a more uneven distribution of income. So although the questions of poverty and the questions of the distribution of income are linked, they're not identical. Give me one more minute and I'll promise I'll stop. Um, what I tried to do is to say the distribution of income is a tricky issue. Everybody cares about it. It's a very tricky issue. Economists are not in a position to say that's the right one and every society that departs from that is wrong. We're not in a position to say that. What I think we are in a position to say is we can help you make your own value judgment. And the way to make your own value judgment is to consider all these things plus the one that I haven't told you about because I couldn't read my own writing. You've been very patient. I think it's time to stop. Um, I suspect you're too worn out to ask any questions, but um, I'll perhaps we'll say if, if afterwards, if you want to ask me, I'll sit around for 10 minutes. If anybody wants to ask me any questions, I'll take it. But I hope that's a some help to you when you think about these issues. Okay. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu/talks.